Mark 9, man brought his son to Jesus. He had just brought his son to the disciples who had been getting people set free and healed. But on this occasion, they did not. They prayed everything they had prayed before, and they rebuked and bound and cast out and laid hands, and nothing, nothing happened. And when Jesus came down from the mount of where he was transfigured and saw the glory and, and spoke with Moses and Elijah, the people came running to him, and uh, the man in verse 17 says, I brought to you my son, which has a dumb spirit, and wherever he takes him, he tears him, and he foams and gnashes with his teeth and pines away, and I brought him, uh, I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. Thank you, Lord. Even when the best of God's people fail and come short, they're still helping Jesus. Right? <clears throat> now, what did Jesus say was the problem? Why they weren't getting results? Faithless. Faithless. And uh, this is the answer. People say, why, aren't we, why don't we see more uh, of this? Or why don't we see more of that? Now, around here, we can't say we don't see any healings and miracles. And, right? right. right? right. We're seeing them. Yes, but how I many would like to see some more? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, what's key to it? There's, uh, you know, we've had people to take us to task and say, well, we don't preach all that healing and all that stuff. We just preach the gospel. And <clears throat> that's humorous if you know some things. But uh, anyway, uh, I asked a fellow one time, I said, well, do, do, do your preachers preach on any of this? He said, no, no, we don't preach on any of that. I said, well, now think about it. I said, we preach on it and we have it. You don't preach on it and you don't have it. I wonder if there's a connection there. <clears throat> These signs follow who? Not them that don't believe it, don't preach on it, don't receive it but those who do. So uh, faith is the determining factor. And if you don't believe this, you're going to be frustrated your whole life. You are going to wander around and flounder around. This, I know it sounds good, but it's just absolutely wrong. This extreme teaching that God is in control. Hmm? You just say that and, and you irritate religious devils. <laughs> Don't you? Yes, Somebody says, well, God is control. Is he? He's completely controlling everything. And everything that happens is him or his will some way or another. See, that's what I'm talking about. And that's just not true. There's all kind of things that's God's will that he would have happen that's not happening. Because people don't believe it. Right? There's all kind of things he's allowing to happen that's evil and bad. And it's not his will that displeases him, that grieves him. But men actually do have a free will. And can choose what they believe or what they don't. Oh, but when you find a group of people that believe, God shows up there. And he does things there. And when the faith increases... So do the manifestations. How many like to kick our faith up another notch? Huh? Another notch. You know, the Lord's been talking to us uh, two or three years now about another level, hasn't he? I mean, one way or another, he keeps talking to us about another level. That was the title of a week of increase. Next level. He keeps talking to us about these same things. And so he said it was faithlessness that was the issue. And the man... Uh, said to him, you know, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And uh, Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. So it, it, he's telling him, it's not up to me. 
And, and most of the religious world don't even believe that. He's saying, no, it's not a matter of what I can do. It's not a matter of the will of God. It's not a matter of the anointing. How many believe the power of God can do anything? But that's not the determining factor. And even the will of God, just because it's the will of God, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Is it God's will for any should to perish? No. 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 Are people perishing? Yes. 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 So just because something's God's will does not mean it's going to happen automatically or that it's ever going to happen That's right. for that individual. Now the overall plan of God is going to be done. Yes, sir. He's going to have a church. Yes, sir. He's going to accomplish his plan right in the earth. Yes. It's going to be done. The question is, is me and you going to be a part of it or not? And that's, that's up to us. But uh, he said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And verse 24, straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, he was moved, wasn't he? Something strong is going on inside of him. He said, Lord, I do believe. I believe. But immediately he said, help my unbelief. What does that mean? Well, you've got to be honest about where you're at in your faith. Yes. Pretending won't get you anywhere. That's right. You can't bluff your way no. <laughs> through these things. No. The devil will call your bluff. Because yes. <laughs> he, he can see some things spiritually. He's been around a long time. He's seen a lot of stuff with human beings. So don't think you're going to outwit him. Right. You're never going to outwit him. He's, who knows, I started to say thousands of years, he's much older than that. Yeah. He's seen all kinds of stuff. You're not going to outwit him. If he can get you in the reasoning realm, he's going to defeat you every time. Right. But if you'll keep him in the faith yeah. realm, yes. yes. nothing he can do with you. Right. He can't do anything with that. <clears throat> so he cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Do, does this show some humility? Yes. It does. Is he acknowledging? Lord, I'm, I, I hear what you say. You're saying if I just believe, my boy can get free. I do. But I got some issues. <laughs> right? I mean, we've been through all this stuff and he hadn't been set free. I just went through all this with your, with your disciples and, and nothing's worked. And so everything's telling him, no, this is never going to be any better. And when you've been living with something for years, you can get too used to it. Yeah. Right? And it can just look impossible to you. And when the experts tell you it's not, it's not going to change and everybody around you tells you it's not going to change and every symptom you're having telling you it's not going to change, well, that's... That, that's pressure that pushes on you. So you, you can understand why he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But did he need help with his faith? Let's say it like that. Go with me to the book of James, fourth chapter, please. Did he need help with his faith? Did he get help with his faith? I mean, soon as he said that, the Lord ministered to his boy, cast that thing out, and he was completely set free. So I reckon him coming in all the faith that he had and asking for help, that was all Jesus needed. He got him the rest of the way, right? No pretending, and yet genuine enough and humble enough to acknowledge where he was at. In James, the fourth chapter, and down about verse uh, 6. It says, He, God, gives more grace. Now, I don't care what you're dealing with. What you need is more grace. With enough grace, you can overcome anything. I mean, you can have habits and bondages that have just been defeating you and, 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 and messing up your life for decades. But with more grace, you can overcome it and not yield to it again. 
Do you believe that? Yes. Another way of saying grace, grace is one of the biggest words in the, in the Bible. And, and, and grace, to, to, to the thing that helped me to understand grace after a number of years now, grace is everything God gives us as a free gift. Everything God has given us, including His help. And with enough of God's help, Come on, do you believe it? Yes. You've been a struggling, you've been a coming up short, and God just gives you another two bushels of grace. Yes. Yes. I don't know if that's the correct measurement, but do you know what I'm, anybody know what I'm talking about? Huh? He gives you some more grace. Can you get more grace? We're reading the verse right here. God, and God does it. He gives more grace. And with that extra help, that extra, and with, with his help comes his knowledge, his understanding, seeing things right, strengthen your spirit, your mind, your soul, your emotions, your body. With enough of his help, you can overcome anything. Yes. And if there's something you've been needing, you know it's bought and paid for, you know it belongs to you, but for some reason you just hadn't received it yet. You come short of it, hadn't received it yet. How many believe with enough grace yes. you could receive that? You could overcome what's, what's lacking and, and get it. So this man needed help, didn't he? I believe, help my unbelief, did he get the help? Who else needs help? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. And I do too. Who gets the help? Look at the verse. Not everyone gets the help, which is why not everyone overcomes. He gives more grace, wherefore, this is connected with getting more grace, God resists the proud. Not only do the proud not get the help, they get resisted too. That's a bad place to be, right? <laughs> How many understand that means you're not making it? Right? You're not going to make it. But he, God, resists the proud. And, and the, the, the further you go into it, the, the Lord ministered. This is one of the very first things he ever ministered to me that I knew he was ministering to me as a boy, reading the Bible through for the first time in my life. And I got to Numbers 12.3. And it says, now the man Moses was meek above all the men that were on the face of the earth. Meek, humble. And the Spirit of God ministered to me sitting in that chair as a boy. I don't mean I heard a voice, but it was very distinct in me, like he'll speak to any Christian if you learn how to listen. The, the, the words and thoughts came up from inside me to my mind. Keith, you know, it delights me every time he calls my name. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. There's such tenderness in it. He's my father. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. He's your father. He said, Keith, did you notice Moses was the most used, most humble man, he said first, most meek man in his whole generation on the earth in his lifetime. I thought, yeah, I see that. There was a, a pause. He said, did you realize he's also the most used man of me in his generation? I had never made that connection. I'm a boy and I saw it. And from that point on, I began to seek out to find out what is humility? Because it's going to determine how much I get used in my lifetime. And you know one of the first things I found out? Was what it's not. <clears throat> oh man, there is so much junk. Religious junk called humility. Self-debasement. Running yourself down. People think that's humility. It's actually contradicting God. 
If you say, oh, I'm nothing. Well, God said he had made you righteous. Amen. How's that humility? Hmm? No. The Bible talks about submitting to the righteousness of God instead of going about to establish your own. It takes humility and submission to admit, I could never be righteous in anything I could ever, I, I couldn't get there on my own. Right. The only way I could ever be righteous is for him to give it to me. That's right. And I just received it. Oh, yes. That requires humility mm-hmm. and submission. But if you do, then you get to help. Amen. Hmm? Yes, Who needs help? Who needs help? In getting there. Overcoming your problems. Receiving all you need and desire. Who needs help? Who needs help? Who's going to get it? Not everybody. Only the humble. So I I begin to, and thank, through the years the Lord would teach me about it. And still to this day, every year, he'll show me something else that is pride and something else that's humility. So that I can distinguish between them. And you know one of the first things I learned? And it was kind of sickening. How much pride I was full of. It ain't pretty. Oh man. And not just me. My family. You know. My dad. My granddad. I love them. They're both in heaven now. But a whole lot of what I, what I learned about being a man. <laughs> being a man. <laughs> is P-R-I-D-E. <laughs> Listen, when people get all up in arms, you, know, you don't say that to my wife. What's the emphasis on? My. That's all about you. You don't, you, you don't get to say that around my, my kids, my house, my, oh, it's so ugly. It, it is. And, and you, you're not going to grow in it until you see the ugly stuff in yourself. So if you get serious about this, you'll ask the Lord, show me, please. Show me this ugly devilish stuff that you hate. He doesn't hate you, but he hates pride because it is the very nature of the devil himself. There's no prouder being ever lived than the devil. He is pride personified. Look with me in Matthew. Well, how are we doing tonight? I said, I thought we were going to talk about miracles. We are. That's what we're talking about right now. We're talking about how to get some. How to get some more. Jesus said in Matthew 11 and verse 28. Jesus said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you want to be unburdened? unloaded, unstressed, and free. Jesus said, I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. And then he tells you how. Look at the very next phrase. Take my yoke upon you. How do you get unloaded? Take his yoke. In order to do that, you're going to have to get rid of the one you got. Hmm? If you're laboring, loaded, heavy laden, depressed, down, you got a yoke. But it's not the Lord's yoke. You got this from the enemy. This yoke can be destroyed by the anointing. You believe it? But the way, you can't just remain empty because the enemy comes back to an empty place. You got to get it replaced with the Lord's yoke. And his yoke is easy. His burden is light. 
He said, come, verse 29, come learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. The same yoke he took upon him when he walked the earth, when, when he fulfilled his ministry here. And learn of me. How many truly want to learn about Jesus? Not something somebody didn't even know him wrote in the book, but who he really is. Who he really is. And how he really is. Well, out of his own mouth, this is how he really is. I am meek. Well, we talked about the Lord said to me, Moses meekest man in his generation was the most used man in his generation. How about Jesus? How many would say meekest man in his generation? And most used man in all history. Right? The Bible said in Philippians, he humbled himself. You talk about humbling yourself. The word humble and meek, literally the, the root of it means low as opposed to high and haughty. And you talk about going low. Jesus left glory. Didn't he? And became a man. We have no idea what a step down that is. We, we have no clue what that would be like to leave glory. And be born in a barn. Right? And be, become a man and walk as a man. He humbled himself, Philippians says, and became like other men. He laid aside his mighty weight and glory. He didn't think being God and being equal with God was something he couldn't lay aside because he laid aside, he didn't stop being God, but he laid aside his omniscience, his omnipotence, his ability to be omnipresent. He really did become a man and function like us. That took some kind of humility, right? I mean, if you're used to living in the palace and they say, come on, I want you to get, get your little bag. We're moving you to the pig pen. Huh? I don't think that tells the story. Going from glory to this curse filled place? I don't think so. I don't think it even comes close. But he did. And that's who he is, that's what he is, that's how he is. And if you want to be like him, you become very, very hungry to find out what true humility is. Because it is Christ likeness. It is being like the master. And being proud is being like, guess who? The enemy. Who do you want to be like? Are you sure? But see, most of us have been brought up and taught to be proud. And that pride's, well, you got to have your pride. Right? I'm proud to be an American. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with that? A lot. Yeah. I'm proud of my kids. Now don't tell me something's wrong with that. See, see, see your response? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to tell you. Look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. See how your face gets all screwed up. Right. <laughs> don't tell me I'm not proud of my kids. You don't need to be proud of them or yourself, or anything you've got, or anything you've done. You need to get completely free from every drop of pride. Yes. Completely free, because all of it's devilish. Yes. Requires mind renewal, doesn't it? Yes. Major mind renewal. Why can't I be proud of my kids? You can be thankful right. for your kids. Mm -hmm. You can be pleased yeah. if you want to please God. You can't be proud about any of it. Thumping your chest. That's my boy. Because <laughs> somewhere or another, see if it's your boy, then it's kind of like your accomplishment too. <laughs> yeah. 
But Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. Didn't he say that? Never took credit for one healing, one miracle, even one message. He said, my, my doctrine's not my own. The Father gave it to me. And when the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well proud. I'm so proud of him. No. In whom I am well pleased. Well, what, what's he well pleased about? What, what's pleasing him so much about this? Go with me to 1 Peter. There's a number of things. He was pleased about. He was pleased about him all the way around. But humility is pleasing to the Lord. It pleases him. And pride is one of the things Proverbs says he hates. Not that he hates a proud man or woman. He hates the pride. He loves the, the person. But he hates the pride. If he hates it, we ought to hate it. Right? And when you see how ugly it is and how devilish, when the Lord opens your eyes to it, I'm telling you, you will despise it. You will detest it. You'll disdain it. I know years ago, as a boy, as a teenager, I began to see it some in myself and begin to see it then. When you see it in yourself, then you'll see it in others. But remember, it's not your job to straighten them out. It's your job to straighten you out. <clears throat> Get it out of you. And boy, the more I did, the more I saw how ungodly it was and even how devilish it is. I don't want to be like the devil. You? Not even a very tiny little bit. You? I want to be like the master. Didn't he say, come learn about me? Is, is that another way of saying, come be like me too? Come, come learn about me and become like me? Of all the things he could have said, he could have said, I'm strong. He could have said, I'm wise. He could have said all kinds of things. What did he say? I am meek. Now, the, the enemy knows how powerful this is, and so he has worked for centuries, actually millennia, to get people pretty much globally, when they hear meek, they think weak. And don't care to know about it or pursue it, because who wants to be weak? And who wants to be somebody's doormat? And who wants to be run over? And nothing could be further from the truth. Was Jesus weak? No. no. Strongest you've ever heard of. And yet he was meek. Do you want to be like Jesus? Yes. Then you want to be meek. Yes. You want to be meek. First Peter. I believe it's the third chapter. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 3. And he's talking about men and women, and husbands and wives. And he's talking about that the outward adornment of the woman is not what makes her beautiful. Beauty comes from the inside. I mean, you can have the latest, greatest fashions and most expensive do and makeup and all that. But if you're ugly on the inside, mm -hmm. people can, and you're just selfish and mean and proud, and people can be around you for just a little while and they realize, hmm, they're not pretty. That's right. Right? That's right? But beauty, even if you hadn't had a lot of time to work on the outside, that day, whatever. <coughs> Beauty from the inside actually gives you a glow. It gives you something you can't buy in a bottle. Hmm? You know what's the most beautiful of all? The glory. The glory of God is beautiful. And God puts his glory on his people. Hallelujah. And did you know the psalmist said, He beautifies the meek with salvation. Oh, somebody say glory to God. He beautifies the meek with salvation. Look in 1 Peter 3 and 4. He goes on to say, 
Don't just let it be the clothes, the hair, the jewelry, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a what? A meek and a quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. You know, I was reading this just, oh, it's just been two or three years ago. And the Lord brought my attention. He said, I didn't just say that was valuable to me in a woman. <laughs> huh? He was talking about a woman, but he just says here, a meek and quiet spirit. Well, who's got a spirit? Everybody. Right? A meek and quiet spirit is in God's sight very valuable. Tremendous value. It is beautiful to him. True humility is beautiful to him, attractive to him. Do you want God to be drawn to you? Oh, yes. Hmm? Yes. Or to resist you? You can see what pride is to him. Pride has a bad and long history in heaven and in creation. The devil developed it on his own and he breathed it into a bunch of the angels and they, they threw off God's uh, oversight of, and lordship over them and rebelled against him and defied him. And then he breathed, devil, the devil breathed this ugly stuff into Adam and Eve. And they did the same thing. Threw off, no longer submitted to God. And uh, so, so it's ugly to God. It, it looks like the devil to God. Why would he resist it? Why would he resist it? You start getting haughty with him. You start getting lippy with him. Hmm? Proud, prideful, haughty. You're not getting help anymore. Now you're getting resisted. You're in trouble. But if you do what? If you humble yourself, here comes the grace. Here comes the help. Here comes more. When, you, when you're just honest and come before God and you acknowledge God, I, I, I need your help. And I know I do. I know I didn't do that on my own. I know that was you. And I know I can't do it. I know I, I, and thank God I'm not without you. You're with me. And I'm depending on you. And I'm open to whatever you tell me. And not just talk, but genuinely willing to do whatever he tells you. And the moment you see you're crosswise with him, you humble yourself. Sorry. I'm sorry, God. Forgive me. I will change. That's right? right? Yes. That's beautiful to him. Amen. It's of great value yes. and price to him. You believe this or not? Yes. Do you want to be attractive to God? Yes. I'm telling you, no amount of hairspray and makeup and jewelry... <laughs> Is going to do it. Because, come, come on now. This whole thing down here is like a wilted plant to him. It's not how he made it. Hmm? It's dying. It's drying up. Curse. The whole deal. You're not going to impress God with natural beauty. Hmm? He's looking forward to the time when he can fix it for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> but what you don't have to wait on, that you can be attractive to him and beautiful to him right now. Right now. Right now. Is what? A meek and a quiet spirit. Because that's how Jesus was and is. And the Father spoke over him. This is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. 
What's that got to do with miracles? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Go with me to Matthew. Actually, did you lose your place in James? I'm sure you did by now. Find it again. James 4. We'll go straight from one to the other. You're in James, James 4. I didn't finish that. And uh, we will go to Matthew 8. Would you have an extra few minutes tonight if I needed it? You know, these are precious times we have together. We'll not always do this. Precious. We're blessed. Got our own place? Huh? Nobody's going to kick us out? I reckon we could stay here till midnight if we wanted to. Who's going to say this? It's our place. You happy about that or not? <laughs> Don't get scared. <laughs> but you know, if we're spiritual, we care about spiritual things more than hurrying home to get a sandwich and watch the news. That's not so spiritual, is it? You know how I learned that? The Lord told me that. I was in a prayer meeting one night that went long. And uh, I was getting fidgety. And I thought, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> the Lord spoke to my heart again, not a voice, but inside. He said, What's your big hurry? What are you hurrying away from? And what are you hurrying to? And of course, He already knows, so you might as well just be straight up with Him, right? No need in, in, in playing games with Him. And I thought, Okay, He wants an answer, so. I am hurrying home to a sandwich <laughs> and to watch the news. And I'm hurrying away from the Word and praying. That really don't sound very spiritual, does it? <laughs> we all got flesh. We've all done it. But we can become more spiritual too. James 4, we didn't finish reading this. James 4, 6, he said, God gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Next verse, submit yourselves. You talk about a politically incorrect word. <laughs> it's this word right here. Yeah, that's right. Submit. Somebody say it out loud. Submit. Submit. Come on, tell your neighbor, see how they take it. Say, submit. Submit. <laughs> submit. Whew, that's fun, huh? <laughs> now, let, let, me, let me jump ahead a little bit here. Husbands, you should never tell your wife that. I'm serious. It is not your place. When God told your wife to submit, he was not talking to you. And that's not between, that's between her and, and him. What if she does it? Well, then she won't. You need to leave her alone. That's between her and God. He told you to love her. Wives, don't you tell your husband how to love you. Same thing. He wasn't talking to you. When he told your husband to love you. That's not your business. Your business is do what he told you to do. Oh, we're having fun now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and so the issue right now is, do I humble myself? Or do I get proud about this? Do I receive it? Do I resist it? Hmm? Do I submit? Submit is a Bible word. Hmm? And what you will find, I could show you probably half a dozen references in the New Testament alone that uses this phrase right here. Submit yourselves. 
You'll find this phrase several times in the New Testament. Who's the understood subject here? You. you. So who's going to make you submit? God's not going to make you submit. Other people should not be trying to make you submit. But if you don't, it's going to cost you. And it can cost you severely. But only you can submit yourself. And what a lot of folks have not understood is they think, well, if God wants me to do something, why don't he just tell me and why don't he just make me? That's not how it works. That's not how he works. You have to go to him and submit yourself to him and really be mean business in your heart. He'll know if you're, if you're playing, if you're not serious. And if you do, then he will reveal things to you and show it to you. You'll find out. But if you stand off and act haughty, well, if he wants me to do something, he knows where I am. You're going to be clueless year after year. Attitude just does not cut it with him. He is the Almighty. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. We haven't seen a fraction of a fraction of how big he is and how great he is and how awesome he is. And he's not going to, he, he could overwhelm the whole earth in, a, in, a, in an hour tomorrow. He, God could put his face in the sky and shout. And the ones that survived. <laughs> Come on, are you listening? Somebody said, why don't he do that? He doesn't want to. Because then faith wouldn't be a factor. What's going on right now is people have to choose when they don't see. Because they believe in him enough and love him enough to come to him with nobody making them and submit their self and say, Lord, here I am. I am yours to do with what pleases you. I will do whatever you say. If you submit yourself, therefore, to God, what's the very next phrase? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, do we, the, the, the text that we just got through reading, the man that had the lunatic son, mm -hmm. did we see Jesus exercise authority? Yeah. Right? And drive that, did they have a miracle? Yes. Was exercising authority a part of it? Yes. And a lot of people, they like to talk about our authority in Christ. And they like to talk about exercising authority. But not so much about submitting to authority. And the truth is, they are connected. You can't have one without the other. If you don't submit to God and what he tells you to submit to, be ready for a shock, or don't be shocked, I should say, when the devil doesn't submit to you. Because he knows. If you're not submitting to God, you're already submitting to him. And if you're submitting to him, he didn't have to submit to you. Can you see this? Which comes first? Resist the devil and he'll flee or submit yourselves to God? Which comes first? Reckon there's a reason why that's that way in that verse. So you must not just be interested in exercising authority. If you really want to see some authority exercised in your life, you've got to be interested in submitting to authority. If you give God his place over you, then you can make the devil take his place under your feet. The word submission is a military word. It means to rank or arrange under. It's the idea of rank, just like it's in the military. If somebody has a higher rank than you in the military, should you submit to that rank? And it doesn't, it doesn't have everything to do with whether you like that person or not, right? Or whether they do everything perfect or not. If you're going to respect the code of the armed force, uh, forces, if you're going to respect uh, all the history that's gone before it and what it takes to make the thing work, you'll respect that rank, yes, mm -hmm. won't you? Yes, 
You can't always respect everything a person, a man or woman in a place of authority says or does. They're human. They're like you. They can mess up and make mistakes. But you must respect the place or that's why you disrespect God. Sit out loud. Submit yourselves to God. Who's going to make you do this? Who's going to follow you around? Argue with you, wrestle with you, push you till you do? Not God. Spiritual people won't do it either. Who's going, to, who's going to do this? You have to submit yourself to him. And then what kind of position does that put you in? You, you're submitting to authority. Now what can you do? You can exercise authority from that place of submission to God. You can exercise authority. And whatever the devil's been wreaking havoc in your life, you can put him out. You can put him on the run. And he knows he has to listen because he doesn't have anything in you. You're giving him no place. So he's got no hook. He's got nothing to work with. He has to just get out. That's all he can do. Now, did you have the place there in, what was it, Matthew? Matthew 8. There's only two places I'm aware of in the scripture where Jesus referred to people having great faith. And this is one of them. And a miracle happened here. We still thinking about miracles? And you see that it's, I mean, directly connected to what we're talking about here. In Matthew 8, <clears throat> Verse 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came to him a centurion beseeching him. Now, who's this guy? He's a centurion. He's an officer in the Roman army. And he said, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Do they need a miracle? They do. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. Somebody say, glory to God. I'll come and heal him. Glory to God. I will. You know, he always says, I will. I will. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Now, this, this is not a religious man, per se. This is a fighting man. Perhaps he's been in, well, no doubt, to get this kind of rank in place, he's proved himself on the battlefield. He's been covered in blood. He's, and in these days, you didn't sit in a room and push a button. No. <laughs> you had to get out there with your blade. It's nasty. And so he, he doesn't, he doesn't feel naturally from all that, all the gore he's seen and been a part of and the death. He said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. Now, what he didn't know is that Jesus has come to make you worthy. No matter what you've been or where you've been. He'd know any of that, of course. He said, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Verse 9, he says, I'm a man under authority. What does that mean? I submit to those that have higher rank than me. I submit to those over me. And I got soldiers under me. He understands both sides of authority. Do we? How many would agree there's more than just exercising authority over the devil? You got to understand both sides of it. You got to understand somebody's over you. Right? And if you don't take your place under the authority above you, then you're not in place to exercise authority over what should be under you. He said, I, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And what happens? 
He goes. I say to another, come. What happens? He comes. He comes. I say to my servant, do this. What happens? I just don't see why we got to do this today. No, 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 no. No. How many know the Bible talks about us being soldiers? Good soldiers. Even enduring hardness. Huh? I think a large part of the body of Christ, it literally looks bad. Huh? Uniform, unbuttoned, if they have one. Shoes never been shined. And the Lord gives an order. And they go, why, Lord? Why? I just don't understand that. You don't have to understand to obey an order. Are we talking about how to get miracles or not? Does anybody remember what we've already covered? The three, the big three on how to get a miracle. Anybody remember? Number one, you must hear from him. Number two, what Jesus' mother's told him, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, now let's back up. This is the, the first record, and the Bible says it's the first miracle in Jesus' life and ministry where the water was turned to wine. Now, when she told him they have no wine, and he said, you know, what's that to do with us? And so then she just turns around and tells them, now whatever he says to you, do it. Are they taking a place of submission? Yes. Come on, can you see this? Are they at a place of readiness and willingness to do whatever he says to them to do, whether they understand it or not, whether he explains it? Are they taking a place of submission? Yes. Whatever he says to you, do it. Get ready, get willing, be prepared. Whatever he says now. And so, sure enough, he must have heard the father say something about this because he only says what he hears the father say. And he turns around and tells them, go fill the water pots with water. And they did it and a miracle happened. Number one, got to hear from him. Number two, obey orders. Do what you were told. Right? And then he, number three, not even your part, he does the miracle. He does it. Well, this man, even though he hadn't been to Bible school, know if he could even read or not. Don't know how much he knew about God, but he understood this. And this just so happened to be one of the main things you need to understand to get a miracle. There's only two instances where Jesus said great faith, and this is one of them. The other one, the Syrophoenician woman. Was there any humility and submission involved in that healing? He said, it's not right to take the children's bread, throw it to the dogs. Could you have got up in arms over that statement? Could you have got your pride rubbed through? Huh? Oh, man. Your ethnic pride. Huh? Your family pride. Your national pride. Because this is Syrophoenician. That'd be like saying Americans. Hmm? Or Southerners. Or whatever it is. Country people. <laughs> or city people. Whatever it is. Oh man. Don't, can you find out about your pride when some of that stuff comes up? Hmm? <clears throat> I've seen people get fighting mad over stuff. Oh, somebody was making fun of my accent uh, years ago. It was actually more pronounced years ago if you can believe that. And one of my relatives got fighting men. So, well, what? Well, they think they don't have an accent? <laughs> and oh, man, they're about to, you know, I think everybody's stupid just because they drawl a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what if they do think you're stupid? Is that really such a big deal? Who are they? How much does it really matter what they think? And what they say. See, the, the, the problem is not them. The problem is your P-R-I-D-E. And it's ugly. It's devilish. It's ugly. Back up to verse 8. Verse, yeah, verse 8. This, does a centurion 
know these keys to getting a miracle, even though he lived a long time ago and never been to Faith Life Church. Right? right? <laughs> what did he know? What does he know he needs? What does he need? Well, he knows he needs a miracle, but to get the miracle, does he know what he needs? He does because of his background, because of what he does. What does he know he needs? He needs a command from someone in authority. Come on, can you see this? And he is ready to submit to it and carry it out. Man, he's carried out orders when they told him to take his soldiers and take that hill when it looked like there was no way you could. He did it. He's a man that follows orders no matter what it takes. He's ready. No matter what Jesus tells him. He's ready. But he knows he can't do it on his own. Here's how you don't get a miracle. Telling God what to do. (laughs) You're not in authority over him. You don't tell him what to do. Huh? Tell him what to do and then wait for him to do it. Somebody say, not Not. how you get a miracle. That's not how you get a miracle. Tell God what to do and then wait. (laughs) No. Let's go over it again. How do you get a miracle? Number one, you got to hear from him. You got to hear from headquarters. You got to hear from headquarters. Then number two, you got to follow orders. Do exactly what he told you to do. Get your boots on the ground and get your little self busy doing what he said do. Then what can you count on? Him showing up and backing up what he told you to do. You can count on it. You're about to see a miracle. Glory to God. So what does he say? He said, Lord, speak the word only. What does he know? We can't can't do anything until we get this. I need to hear something from you, commander. Hmm? When you need a miracle, what's the first thing to do? Not start rebuking and binding. Not start fasting and praying and making confessions and trying to manipulate God and tell him what to do. No, 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 no. The fasting and praying is a good part, but in order to hear from him, not try to coerce him, to hear from him. Speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. And then he tells the Lord why he knows that. Because I'm a man who have people over me. And when they give me an order, I do it. Amen. And I got people under me. And when I tell them to do something, they do it. And what's, what's he, is he showing respect? Yes. Why is he talking to Jesus? He's saying, you have authority. Right? You have authority over this. I have, I have faith in you. I have respect for you. And is he there in a position of submission? Ready to take an order. You tell, you, you just give the word, Lord. You don't have to come to my house. You don't have to see him. You don't have to pray over him. You don't have to lay hands on him. If I could just get you to give a command to us. <laughs> and look at what Jesus says. Jesus marveled. Do you think he marveled about every little silly thing that he came across? No. So when the master marvels, you know you are talking about something very significant here. Something big that you don't see every day. And we've talked about that, how precious faith is. What else is he seeing? He's seeing humility. He's seeing submission, which is beautiful to God. He marveled and he said to them that followed, I say, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Keep reading. I say to you, many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's me and you. Huh? We can't trace any Jewish lineage, but Abraham claims us because Jesus claims us. But the children of the kingdom, ones that should have been in, that had the natural heritage, that rejected Jesus, be cast out. 
There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Keep going. Jesus said to the centurion, man, this is what he's been looking for. Is this what he's needing? Huh? Somebody said, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. No, you need to hear from God. Hmm? You, you need to hear from God. You hear from God and do what he said, you'll get the miracle. You don't even have to make the miracle happen. He makes the miracle happen. Can anybody get excited about this? Besides this? Why would the Lord be telling us all these things? Why? 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 We already having things going on. How many can see God's going to kick it up in another gear? Can you see it? All he needs is some more cooperation out of you and me. That's why he's talking to us about it. He's gearing us up. Why? So that every morning we pop out of bed and go, reporting for duty, sir. I just, I just need to hear from you on this, Lord. What do I do? And then when he tells you, there you go. You do it without delay, without discussion. Hmm? Go your way. As you believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed in the self-same hour. Oh, somebody say miracle, 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 miracle. How many people can use a miracle in your life? Everybody, all over the place. Some seem more urgent and pressing than others, but everybody needs miracles in their life on an ongoing basis. What's a miracle? It's something you can't do, something no man can do. It's the power of God that makes possible. Amen. When men say it can't be, God says, oh, yes, it can. Yes, right? right? But it's not just up to us begging God and trying to talk him into doing it. He already, it's his will for it to happen. It's a matter of faith and a matter of cooperation. Stand on your feet, everybody. And let's open our heart wide for him to teach us more about this. Oh, just close your eyes and focus on Him. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Just pray this out loud after me. Father God, forgive me for any haughtiness for resisting you or not submitting to you. Forgive me for giving place to the enemy through rebellion or disobedience. I understand that you love me, but you hate that because that is the nature of the devil himself. I don't want to be like that. I don't want any of that to remain in me. I'm asking you, by your mercy and grace, open my eyes, help me to see pride and rebellion in me. And I ask for grace and understanding to know how to deal with it and get it out of me and yield to it no more, no more in Jesus' name.